In this lesson, we're going to go over self-defense, defense of others, and defense of property as defenses to intentional tort liability. So one of the first important notes here to make right off the top before we jump into the actual elements here is that our rules for self-defense are going to be very similar to our rules for self-defense in the criminal law context. And I know most of the time I say, hey, look, we should always keep criminal law and tort law totally separate in our minds. And this is usually true. I will say this is one of the rare times, though, that there is just so much overlap. Really, the analysis from a legal analysis perspective is going to stay very similar when we're thinking about self-defense in terms of tort law and criminal law. Of course, in real life, the way a fact finder would approach these analyses would be totally different because in real life, we know the burdens of proof between civil and criminal liability are going to be totally different and just the procedures between criminal and civil procedure. So there still would be a lot of differences in real life, but for our purposes, just applying the elements to the fact pattern going to be a lot of similarity. All of this to say, if you've seen our criminal law video on self-defense, this is going to be a large kind of review of a lot of those concepts, okay? But with that, we can just jump right into self-defense as a defense to intentional tort liability. Self-defense, defense of others, and defense of property are justification defenses. Essentially, what we're saying here is that the defendant is justified in using force upon another, or in other words, the defendant has a privilege to use force upon another if these requirements are satisfied. Number one, the defendant is not the aggressor in the conflict. And two, three, and four, the defendant reasonably believes both objectively and subjectively that the amount of force applied is necessary to protect himself from the imminent use of unlawful force by the other party. So basically, to successfully assert self-defense as a defense to intentional tort liability, the defendant's going to have to show these four things. Number one, that the defendant is not the aggressor in the conflict. We can start here. This should be fairly intuitive, right? The person who is the aggressor in the conflict which is basically going to be the person who makes the first show of force in the conflict is not going to be able to assert self-defense successfully, right? Because you're not really defending yourself if you're the first aggressor in a conflict. So typically the way this is going to play out, the way this is going to be presented in fact patterns is a situation where you have some sort of conflict between two people. It could be some sort of argument, could be some sort of conflict, some sort of fray, some sort of disagreement, but typically we're gonna have two people in some type of conflict. And at some point in this conflict, one of the individuals is going to basically escalate the conflict from just an exchange of words to an exchange of force or a threat of force. Basically, you see that escalation from words alone to violence. And whoever's responsible for making that escalation is going to hold the status of aggressor in the conflict. And that person cannot assert self-defense as a defense, basically to show justification in using force upon the other party. Okay, now the most important thing to recognize with this first element is that the status of aggressor can change in the conflict. And there's really two ways that the status of aggressor can change. We have renunciation and escalation. Okay, so number one, if a person basically renounces their show of force through words and conduct, they can potentially lose their status as aggressor in the conflict, which can kind of you know, let them regain their status to be able to assert self-defense successfully. Okay, so basically, if you have two people in an argument, you know, say it's a standard bar fight, we have some sort of bar fight that's breaking out, two people have a disagreement, you know, at a bar, 
and one of the individuals in this conflict, say the defendant, pulls out a gun and says, you know, I've had enough of you insulting me, you know, you need to be quiet because I have this gun, right, whatever. So at that point, when the defendant pulls out the gun, he's just escalated this from an exchange of words to, you know, violence. He's making this threat of force. He's showing a weapon that can cause, you know, deadly harm to another person. So he's now the aggressor. So at this moment in time, in our analysis, that defendant who's pulled out the gun has the status of aggressor. He cannot assert self-defense. No matter what happens from this point forward, right, at that moment in time, he is the aggressor. He will not be able to assert self-defense as a claim. But of course, he could lose that status as aggressor. Let's say under renunciation, right? Say our defendant pulls out the gun, shows the gun, but then he changes his mind. And he says, you know what? I've made a huge mistake. I shouldn't have pulled out my gun. I'm really sorry for that. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm gonna put the gun back in the holster and I'm just gonna leave, man, all right? I don't mean you any harm. So if that happens, our defendant takes the gun, he puts it back in the holster, says I mean you no harm, and he leaves the bar. Say he exits and he's like getting into his car. Well, at that point, he's lost the status of aggressor because he's made a renunciation. So at that point, if as he's getting into his car, the other guy basically wants to retaliate, so he comes running out and tackles our defendant. And then they get into a fight, and then the defendant wants to raise self-defense as a claim. He could, because he no longer holds the status of aggressor. Another way to think about that is really we have two separate conflicts. We have the first conflict where he was the aggressor, then he renounces that you know, status as aggressor, leaves the bar, starts to get into his car, and we have a second conflict. And in that second conflict, he's no longer the aggressor, okay? So the status of aggressor can change through a fact pattern. Number one, we have renunciation. Number two, we have escalation. Basically, if a person, you know, substantially raises the level of force, that's being applied or being threatened at some point during the conflict, that can also change basically the status of aggressor between the two parties. So say that somebody is again into a, a, a verbal argument. We have a verbal argument happening between two people. And let's say that our defendant is the first one to make a threat of force. Say the defendant pulls out a dry erase marker. Our defendant has in his pocket a dry erase marker. So he pulls out the dry erase marker and he's like, I'm going to hit you with this dry erase marker. I'm gonna throw this dry erase marker and I'm gonna hit you with it, okay? Well, that's the first show of force. So at that moment in time, our defendant is the aggressor in the conflict, right? At that moment in time, he holds the status of aggressor. Of course, though, that's a threat of non-deadly force, right? Throwing a marker at somebody really can't kill them in any you know, sensible way. If you throw a dry erase marker at someone, you know, probably the worst case scenario is you hit someone in the eye. It could harm them seriously. You shouldn't be throwing dry erase markers at people. It still is a threat of force, but it's non-deadly force. So if the other party, as he's being threatened with a dry erase marker, pulls out a gun, right? Now he's just escalated this altercation from non-deadly force to deadly force. So the status of aggressor is going to flip right there. When he pulls out the gun, now he's the new aggressor in the conflict. Basically, if he pulls out the gun and starts to shoot at this guy, at the original person, the defendant, and then the defendant pulls out a gun, and shoots back, well, he's not, the defendant is not the aggressor there. Even though the defendant was the one who made the first show of force. Remember, the defendant is the initial aggressor. The defendant takes out the dry erase marker and says, I'm gonna hit you with this. That's the first threat of force. So he's the initial aggressor, but when that other guy pulls out the gun and escalates the conflict from non-deadly force to deadly force, he becomes the aggressor. So when the defendant responds to this deadly force, he's no longer the aggressor in the conflict.
Okay, so in that case, at least the defendant would satisfy this first element. He might be justified in using force as long as these other requirements are met there, even though he was technically the first person to show force in the conflict. Okay, but those are the two ways, renunciation and escalation, that the status of aggressor can change in a conflict. Otherwise, it's the person who first makes the show of force. So that's your starting point. Which party is the first party, basically, to escalate this from a verbal exchange to like a show of violence, to using force or threatening to use force? Okay, that's the aggressor the initial aggressor, we know the aggressor cannot assert self-defense as a claim to intentional tort liability. So unless that status changes through renunciation or escalation, that party will not be able to assert self-defense. Of course, unless the status changes, okay? And there's two ways, renunciation, escalation, we went through both of those. Okay, so that's your first element. You always want to make sure that the defendant is not the aggressor. That should be fairly intuitive. Just think about it, right? Obviously, the person who's the one that's, you know, escalating this from nonviolence to violence shouldn't be able to assert self-defense, right? They started it. So that's kind of the idea of this first element, right? We have to make sure that the defendant is not the aggressor in the conflict. The next three elements are really just about reasonable proportionality. It's about reasonableness and proportionality. These next three things are really focusing on basically the reasonableness of the defendant's conduct and the proportionality of the defendant's conduct. We just have to make sure that the amount of force that's being applied is reasonable and proportional in this situation. And so the best way to word it is kind of the way we have it with these three elements. We need to make sure, number one, of course, the defendant is not the aggressor in the conflict, and two, three, and four, that the defendant reasonably believes, this has got to be both objective and subjective, that the amount of force applied is necessary to protect himself from the imminent use of unlawful force by the other party. Okay, so the best way to think about this again is reasonableness and proportionality and this will really hold true for defense of others and defense of property this is the main kind of crux of self-defense defense of property and defense of others as defenses as justification defenses the idea of proportionality and reasonableness so in any of those examples, take the threat to throw a dry erase marker at someone, right? If our defendant is threatening to throw a dry erase marker at someone, you know, and the defendant winds up and as he's threatening to throw the dry erase marker, you know, he's getting ready to throw this thing at somebody. If the other side gets up and shoots the defendant with a gun as he's winding up to throw a dry erase marker at this person, right? is that proportional behavior. Imagine that actually the defendant is the other side. So imagine the defendant is the one pulling out the gun and shooting the person who's about to throw a dry erase marker at him. So let's say our defendant is in a altercation, is in a conflict with another person, and the defendant sees, hey look, I'm about to get hit by a dry erase marker. You know, that is, a force that's about to be applied to that defendant. So the defendant there is justified in using force to protect himself. Like that's the whole idea of self-defense. We know if the defendant reasonably believes that the amount of force applied is necessary to protect himself from the imminent use of unlawful force by the other party, and he's not the aggressor in the conflict, right, he can successfully assert self-defense as a claim. So in that situation where our defendant sees that a guy is about to throw a dry erase marker at him, well, he's going to enjoy, in most cases, some privilege to use force to protect himself. But we have to think about what force, what amount of force is reasonable in that situation. If someone's throwing a dry erase marker at you, would it be reasonable to pull out a gun and shoot them to stop them? And the answer is gonna be no, it's not proportional. I mean, what amount of force could you use there? Like typically, 
we'd be expecting something similar to a dry erase marker. If you see somebody's about to throw a dry erase marker at you, you would probably have the privilege to pull out a dry erase marker and try to throw it at them first to protect yourself, right? Maybe you want to hit them in the hand so you can, you know, knock the dry erase marker out of their hand and protect yourself. Like that would be reasonable in the situation, right? In that situation, if our defendant sees he's about to get hit by a dry erase marker, let's say the defendant is not the aggressor in the conflict, does the defendant there reasonably believe that the amount of force being applied, basically throwing a dry erase marker back at the guy who's throwing a dry erase marker at him, is necessary to protect himself from the imminent use of unlawful force by the other party? Like that would satisfy these three elements. That would be an honest and reasonable belief that the amount of force being applied, basically throwing a dry erase marker back at the guy who's throwing a dry erase marker at him, is necessary to protect himself from the imminent use of unlawful force by the other party. It's imminent force, right? The dry erase marker, the guy's winding up about to throw this dry erase marker, so it is imminent. It's unlawful. Let's say this guy doesn't have any privilege to be throwing a dry erase marker at our defendant. So in that case, the defendant would be able to likely say that the dry erase marker hits the guy on his hand and the aggressor you know, has some sort of injury. You know, He's got a bruise or whatever, so he sues the defendant. The defendant could claim self-defense. Hey, look, I wasn't the aggressor and I reasonably believed that I had to throw this dry erase marker at the other guy to protect myself from the imminent use of unlawful force. He was about to throw his dry erase marker at me. I had to do it to protect myself. The idea there is we have a dry erase marker for a dry erase marker. It's very reasonable, it's very proportional, okay? That is what courts are going to want to see when we're applying self-defense. The problem is when somebody does something that's not proportional, right? If you're about to be hit by a dry erase marker, our aggressor is throwing a dry erase marker at the defendant, defendant can't pull out a gun and shoot that guy to stop him. That would not be reasonable. That's not the amount of force necessary to protect himself, right? You have a lot lower levels of force you could resort to to protect yourself from being hit by a dry erase marker, right? And really anytime somebody's escalating from non-deadly force to deadly force, we're going to have these proportionality problems and there's gonna be a lot of problems with the amount of force that's being applied. Is the amount of force being applied necessary? Is it reasonable? You know, we're going to run into issues when proportionality is not there. Okay, so those are the main things to think about. Really, this whole analysis just comes down to those concepts of reasonableness and proportionality. Okay, of course, too, it's important to note that the defendant here, it's both objective and subjective. When we're thinking about what the defendant reasonably believes is necessary to protect himself. It's got to be an honest belief and a reasonable belief. So if the defendant has some sort of actual knowledge that the aggressor isn't actually going to hurt him, then he's not going to be privileged. He's not going to be justified in using force. So imagine the scenario where we have a toy gun, right? This is something you could see tested. If our aggressor comes at the defendant with a fake gun, but say the gun looks 100% real, like it's a 100% replica of a real gun, but it's fake, it doesn't shoot anything, it can't actually cause anyone harm. Well, if our aggressor comes up to the defendant with a fake gun, and the defendant does not know that the gun is fake, and the defendant, in order to protect himself, uses a real gun on the aggressor. So say our aggressor pulls out a fake gun and the defendant fears for his life, thinks he's about to be killed by this guy. Say our aggressor says, hey, I'm gonna kill you with this gun, you know, whatever, and the defendant quickly pulls out his own gun and shoots the guy. Okay, under those facts, 
the defendant would probably be justified under a strict interpretation of these elements, right? The defendant is not the aggressor in the conflict and the defendant reasonably and honestly believes that the amount of force applied is necessary to protect himself from the imminent use of unlawful force by the other party. Yes, all of those would be satisfied, right? The defendant, it's reasonable, most people would believe that if a gun is being pointed at them and the assailant is threatening to kill you, that you that the amount of force being applied basically shooting that person back is necessary to protect yourself from what would be the imminent use of unlawful force right you're about to be shot and killed with this gun that's the imminent use of unlawful force by the other party you have an honest and reasonable belief that you need to shoot them to protect yourself okay and the defendant there is not the aggressor so probably these elements are satisfied in that type of fact pattern, even though the gun in all actuality that the aggressor had couldn't cause harm to anyone, right? That's not what we're looking at. We're not looking at whether that gun was real or not real. It's did the defendant have a reasonable and honest belief that the gun was real? Now, of course, if we change the fact pattern and we say, hey, look, the defendant had actual knowledge that the gun wasn't real. Say the defendant, you know, is an expert in guns and can look at the gun and instantly knows it's a fake. He's 100% certain that that guy is holding a fake toy gun. Well, then he's not going to be justified in shooting him to defend himself, right? Because even though the belief might be reasonable, even though most people might believe it's a real gun, he subjectively honestly knows that shooting this guy is not necessary because the gun is fake. Okay, so that's what we mean by objective and subjective in terms of this belief that the defendant has. Okay, one other important note here would be the duty to retreat. Anytime we're thinking about a defendant using deadly force to protect himself, we have to ask ourselves, does the defendant have a duty to retreat? Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no risk, free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata videos. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. 
Um, I think that the Sudakata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Sudakata video lectures throughout my law school career and I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.